Today, I'm going to show you how I made an AI that destroys Tetris. And I don't mean one that plays a perfect pre-planned game on an emulator. I mean one that plays the same way that you and I do. It has to use the information on screen, it has to use a controller, and most challengingly, it has to run on a Nintendo Entertainment System from the 80s. For an AI, this is hard mode. So why would anyone make a bot to play Tetris? Well, short story, I'm terrible at this game. I watched people play it when I was growing up, but I never really got the hang of it. Go oh, freaking... Like I said, I'm awful at it. Go in the hole! How hard is it? So how are we going to make our Tetris AI? I'd love to say that I made a sweet pair of electronic arms and hooked them up to a webcam, but the truth is, is that's hard and I am incredibly lazy. So plan B is we're going to do the same thing, but electronically. We hack into the controller signal on the way into the Nintendo, and then we capture the output going to the TV. This lets us see what a human would see and send controls like a human would, but we do it electronically, which makes it a lot easier for me. Let's take a look at the supplies we're going to need for this project. First off, I have a replacement controller. I'm using replacement controller because I don't want to destroy original hardware, and believe me, this thing is being destroyed. I'm not a monster. Next up, we have an Arduino. This Arduino is basically a computer that I'm going to program to convert a USB signal into a voltage. This is how we're planning on hacking into the controller itself. Finally, we have our capture device. Now this particular capture device can convert the RCA signal coming out of the Nintendo into a USB signal, which basically looks like a USB webcam to the computer. In this case, I have bought the cheapest possible one on the market. Buy good stuff, you idiot! No. No, it, it'll be fine. It'll... Shut up, it's fine. It's fine. So how did I make my controller interface? As you can see, I'm taking the pins on the buttons from the controller and soldering those so they can connect to the Arduino's output pins. I can then apply a high or low voltage on each of these pins, and as far as the Nintendo's concerned, you pushed a button. The electronic signal's the same, regardless of how it's generated. I want to say that I carefully researched how the Nintendo voltages worked on their controllers and then copied them, but that would be a lie. I just took out a multimeter and started checking voltages, and then once I thought I had a good idea of how it worked, I started zapping things. It's sort of miraculous this thing hasn't exploded yet, and to be honest, I think it might catch fire at any time, so... science. Also, uh, here's the finished product. As you can see, I have a controller board with all of the wired wires soldered in, connected to a breadboard, connected to an Arduino. Now, there's a few extra connections here that uh, are responsible for keeping voltages balanced and stuff. I didn't talk about those before. Like I said, I'm not going to go over everything in detail. If this thing looks like it's a fire hazard, it's because it's a fire hazard. Now that we've figured out how to connect our Arduino into our Nintendo, the last step is to write a little bit of code. And by a little bit of code, I mean a lot of code. The first critical piece of code is one that looks at the capture device and can tell us what is on screen at any given time. Once we know what's on screen, we throw this information into an AI core. This is going to break down the pieces into active pieces that are movable and fixed pieces that are part of the background. We're then going to look over every possible move combination we could make and pick the one which the AI thinks is going to have the highest chance of us surviving longer. Finally, the best move is sent back into the Nintendo through the Arduino as a set of button pushes. All of this code is honestly kind of horrifically ugly and just a giant spaghetti-like mess, so I'm not planning on posting it right now, but if you want more details, I have my original video draft which was quite a bit more in-depth and you can get to part of it here or in the description below. All right, now that all of our software and hardware is complete, let's set this baby loose on some Tetris blocks. Okay. 
So it turns out you actually need to train your AIs before you use them. Whoops. Also, this is going really slowly. Like, we're gonna be here forever. So, plan B, let's actually do the training in a Tetris simulation, that way I can run a whole bunch of them at once. We're still gonna have to wait a little bit, but I should be able to come back in a couple of days and then it should be good to go. So, see you in a bit. Finally, RAI is ready to face the full game. At this point, it's better than I am at Tetris in every single way. This leaves us with just one question. How far can this AI go? For human players, the biggest difficulty jump occurs between levels 18 and 19. At level 19, blocks are falling every second frame. As you can see though, our little AI handles it like a champ. I wish I could give it little bot treats at moments like this and tell it it's doing great. Our little AI has just one more challenge left to overcome, a thing human players call the kill screen. At level 29, the Tetris blocks begin to fall every single frame. Every frame is 16 milliseconds long. From the instant the piece appears, we have 20 frames, or just under a third of a second to place our piece. The information enters our capture card, but now we wait. The capture card only really handles 30 frames per second, and it lags deeply while it's doing this. By the time it reaches our PC, we've already spent eight of our frames. In less than a frame, the PC figures out where the pieces are, but now it struggles with the hard part. There are thousands of possible next moves to consider, looking at both the current piece and the next piece, looking at all possible rotations and where we're going to move them left and right. Precious frames are expended comparing all of our options. With only six frames remaining of our original 20, a decision is made and data begins streaming to the Arduino, giving instructions for where to move the piece. It's too late. The moves are swallowed in the space between the piece appearing, and failed consistency checks begin to crop up in the AI. The AI doesn't know what to do. Things are too fast for it. Death, in the end, comes swiftly for it. I like to think that it didn't suffer. But don't feel too badly for our little AI, where it failed, countless other people have failed with it. Although many people may have beaten level 29 and simply never recorded it, the first time we caught it on film was in 2009, nearly 20 years after the game was released. Even today, less than 100 people are known to have beaten this level. This just goes to show how good humans are at playing this type of game. I can't quite beat a human player with off-the-shelf hardware. Admittedly, not using the cheapest possible capture card would have helped. Told you! So what's next for our little channel? I have a Minesweeper AI ready to go that uses neural nets to solve Minesweeper faster than any human being can. If you want to see that content, be sure to subscribe so that you get notified when it's released. If you want to support us, consider liking this video or even sharing it on social media. For small creators, this makes an enormous difference. What did you think about the video today? If you have ideas for other things we could do with Tetris or even other NES games, let us know in the comments below. It tells YouTube that this is important and also, honestly, the ideas are incredibly helpful. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I will see you next time.